There's something about worship music when um, I don't know if it's a softening of the heart or opening of the heart. I'm, I'm convinced there's something about drawing near to God that's going to keep you you open in, to some degree. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests share the indelible power that music has to heal our hopes and hearts. Worship leader, Matt Redman, and singer-songwriter, Mark Schultz. Grammy-winning worship leader, Matt Redman, has traveled all over the world, bringing people together in song. Along the way, he has sung in venues such as Madison Square Garden, Wembley Stadium, as well as recording in iconic studios such as Abbey Road in London and Capitol Records in L.A. Matt believes in the healing power of worship in our lives and credits his expression to God through music for saving his life during an extremely difficult time. My name is Matt Redman. I was born in the UK. I currently live in California with my wife Beth and our five kids. We've got one daughter and four boys from the age of uh, 19 down to 10. And so it's never a boring moment and we, we love doing life. Sometimes people ask me, why do you write songs or what, how did you start writing songs? And the reason was because I needed to. I needed to talk to God. I needed to cry out to God. And the music seemed like a really powerful way to do that. When I was seven years old, I lost my father. He actually took his own life. And that was obviously a, a crazily hard thing to take in and process at the time. But then things didn't get much better. Um, some abuse happened to me in my teenage years. Uh, the guy who did that ended up going to jail. And it was a crazy turbulent time. But the thing that was keeping me sane and stable was my faith, and particularly faith expressed through music. So I started playing music because I wanted to sing some of the songs we were singing at church. What actually happened was a group came over from America a month after my dad died and they brought this wonderful new expression of worship music. And for me, it was so captivating. I couldn't have summed it up at the time, but I guess the dynamic that I was seeing was the people of God in the presence of God, pouring out the praises of God. There was something so um, appealing about what these, these guys were doing. And so from that moment on, I, I loved worship music. I remember the first song I ever led, it was There is a Redeemer by Melody Green. And it was just, um, I don't think we even got to the third verse. We never got to stand in glory because uh, I was so nervous I could barely get through the first two verses. But the moment I started doing that, I loved it. I loved seeing what God could do through these songs. I loved seeing people connect with him through them. I loved that we weren't just singing about him, but we were singing to him. I love that we weren't just singing to him, but we were drawing near to him and he was drawing near to us. There was this divine encounter happening through these simple little songs, which was so hard to describe or express, but it was so real. And it became apparent we're worshiping the living God here. What became apparent the older I became and the older my kids became and the more I, I was married, it became apparent that actually in some of the areas particularly to do with emotional availability, emotional capacity, emotional attunement, I was not very strong at all. I needed some help. And I went to see a counselor and the counselor explained to me that you can't compartmentalize with your emotions. You can't be shut down towards your father's suicide when you were age seven, but then super alive towards your son's and your daughter and your wife, it doesn't work like that. If, you, if you're going to shut down, you're going to become a little shut down across the board. And I think maybe I'd always explain that away as, oh, it's kind of my personality or, you know, I'm just not that sort of person. But I started to realize it's actually affecting the ones I love. It's affecting my family. It's affecting my friends. This is not really a healthy way to do life. When you're in some kind of ministry up front on a stage or something, for me, it's doing music. If you're not careful, that stage can become a barrier. It can become a barrier to letting other people into your life, to speak into your life, to look into your life, to be close, to accountability, you know, sharpening, all that kind of thing. But also, you can even use the stage as a barrier to letting God work in your life. 
you know leadership doesn't guarantee you're going to be have good character or be healthy emotionally in fact it's probably going to test you to the extreme being on that stage and carrying some of the things you carry and ministering some of the ways you minister it, it might make it more important that you deal with some of these things and you don't let any of that psychological junk get in the way of your leadership the interesting thing for me as a worship leader and songwriter i do believe i had some measure of healing or 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 health just through the fact that i was opening my heart up to god through worship music and when you worship the living god you can expect that kind of thing you can expect encounter and you can expect it to be this not just this ritual or rite, but relationship this dynamic open-ended conversation uh with, with jesus the jesus calling books have really played quite a prominent role in our family's spiritual life um, right now they're coming out daily my wife beth has been so good at doing that and sitting our kids down and one of them will do the reading for the day and the thing i love about that it tells you god is speaking it tells you god is speaking to you sometimes when we think about prayer we just think about us speaking to him we're pouring out our praise or our requests yeah that's a great thing to do but the great thing about jesus calling is that whatever else you do in your day it reminds you god is actually wanting to speak to you if you quiet yourself down you can hear the voice of god and that's a really really important part of faith isn't that sometimes the biggest challenge of all life is never not busy there's always distraction there's always something else to do but something about taking time to listen taking time not just to pour out your prayers and your requests but taking time to quiet yourself still yourself wait on god see what he might have to say to you today being a songwriter I've, I've always been fascinated with the psalms you know i love that right there in the middle of scripture we've got these 150 songs in fact they would have been the hymn book of jesus as he walked the earth and you'll find every imaginable emotion in those you'll find the depths of depression and angst and you'll find the heights of joy and celebration and there's something in there for wherever you're at in life and isn't it wonderful that that right there in the middle of scripture is this hymn book this song book and we've always been in a singing people the people of god have always been a singing people you look throughout history and you'll see that the people of god found a way to sing to jesus together and i love looking at some of the old hymns some of the truth they bring some of the angles onto the the cross of christ or the windows onto the heart of god or the story of god that they bring and I love that these days, worship leaders like me, we get to carry on in that tradition and try and find new ways to sing to God. 10,000 Reasons has been the song which has connected the most, had the most momentum. It's such a simple little song. It doesn't even have a pre-chorus or a bridge. It's to the point where I didn't even know if it was finished before we recorded it. Some other people on the team strongly encouraged me. Uh, yeah, we're definitely recording this one. And it's just been wonderful. It's just four chords and the truth. It's nothing complicated or, or super progressive creatively about it, but it's just a simple little hymn or song to Jesus. And it's been really, uh, I don't know, humbling, exciting, encouraging, just seeing that song travel around the world, maybe from a you know, little back street in Mumbai somewhere and getting a video of an orphanage singing it or uh, a township in somewhere in Africa or somebody in a hospital room. I think one of the challenges of trying to portray God through music is to do with trying to paint the biggest picture of him that you can. Obviously our vocabulary is very limited for starters, but it's more than that. It's something about the culture we live in where so much goes in the opposite direction. You can't worship without wonder. You know, you can adore, applaud, admire without wonder, but you cannot worship without a sense of wonder. For worship really to be worship, that has to be in the mix it's a key ingredient and i think that's the challenge when we're trying to portray an accurate image of god in our music 
does what we're singing match up with the God we meet in scripture? You know, he's the lion and the lamb. He's the God who thunders and whispers. He's a God who terrifies, and yet he befriends. He's the, the one who knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples, even though he's the one whose foot stores the earth. He's the one who hung in agony on beams of wood that he himself had called into being. This is Jesus. This is who we worship. We can sing about the name of Jesus, the throne of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, all those things, the word of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, all those things are completely unshakable and unchangeable. You can find Matt Redman's latest record, Let There Be Wonder, anywhere you buy music. We'll be right back after a brief message about a way you can connect to Jesus Calling readers each week through prayer. Did you know that Sarah Young, the author of Jesus Calling, prays for her readers each day? In that spirit, we want to extend the Jesus Calling prayer community out to you in a more personal way. Each Tuesday morning, you can dial into the Jesus Calling weekly prayer call, where the team from Jesus Calling and special guests will minister to us during a 10-minute call to reflect on that day's passage from Jesus Calling, read scripture references, and pray together for each other and our world. Prayer call times are 8 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Central, 6 a.m. Mountain, and 5 a.m. Pacific, and are for U.S. only. For more information on the Jesus Calling weekly prayer call or to submit prayer requests, please visit jesuscalling.com slash prayer dash call. Again, to join us in this community of prayer every Tuesday morning, please visit jesuscalling.com slash prayer dash call. Singer-songwriter Mark Schultz came to Nashville, supported by the love of his parents, a strong faith, and a big dream to make it in the music business. But when he didn't get the red carpet rollout he thought was waiting for him, Mark began to doubt his dreams of writing and performing, until one day he was waiting tables and he met a customer who would change his life forever. I'm Mark Schultz, singer-songwriter. I've been uh, doing music, gosh, I guess I came to Nashville in 1994. Uh, and thought I'd get a record deal as soon as I drove into town. Obviously, whoever was giving those out was at lunch when I came in. But uh, yeah, I became a youth director uh, for about seven years. And uh, I would say it was the greatest job that I ever had. And then, uh, and that turned into full-time music for the last, gosh, 20 years. You know, I grew up in Colby, Kansas, which is a town of 5,000 people, which is not all that big. But I was adopted, my mom and dad, I always say I got the best mom and dad in the world. And I was the middle kid who was adopted. And so they had my brother. He's five years older than me. And I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if they knew they could have kids after that. So they adopted me. And then, as so often happens, uh, my sister was born a year later. And uh, I didn't even know what adopted meant. My sister and I were going through our uh, baby books. And I said, hey, Sue, my sister has more information in hers than I do. And I said, what's, you know, what's that about? And my mom said, well, that's because uh, you're special, you're adopted. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And mom said, well, we got to pick you out special with your brother and sister. God gave us your brother and sister, but you, we got to uh, pick you out special. And I always loved that story because as we got older, my sister and I were you know, a year apart in junior high, so we'd get in arguments. And uh, we were having an argument one day, and she said, oh, yeah, well, and she was just mad. And she said, you're not even supposed to be in this family because you're adopted. And uh, it should have really devastated me, but I began to smile, and I just remembered the words of my mom. And I said, yeah, that, that means mom and dad picked me out special. They just got stuck with you. And so uh, I've always loved that I've been adopted, and it's a, a special part of my story. And I, again, I feel like I got the best parents in the world. But grew up in, um, in a small town. And uh, I was the quarterback in high school, and I played basketball, and I was the pitcher in uh, baseball, and I ran track and went to church. My mom and dad were the Sunday school teachers when I was in grade school in a little Methodist church there in Colby. So uh, church and faith has been uh, a part of my life ever since I can remember. I used to sell pianos because I love pianos, and uh, I would sell a piano and I would play it in people's houses, and that's how I sold the piano. So they were like, hey, could you play us some songs? So I would. And uh, and I would write songs, and I just loved that. And, uh, and, a, and a, a girl that I knew when I was in college, I continued to write songs. I would and stay up late and go to the music room. I was in a special singing group in Kansas State. And uh, I would sneak into the uh, practice rooms at two o'clock in the morning to write my songs. And she said, you know, you, I can see you being a pop singer, songwriter, or a Christian singer, songwriter. 
And I said, a Christian singer-songwriter? I don't even know what that is, because in my small hometown, we didn't have Christian music. You know, there was not a Christian radio station. And uh, it wasn't until I met a girl in college that introduced me to Stephen Curtis Chapman and said, uh, hey, you've got to come to this concert. And I said, well, I don't even know. what." And I went to the concert, and after it was over, we went out in the parking lot, and before we left, uh, this group of people that I got invited to go with all got in a circle, and they held hands, and they prayed for each other before we left. And I was like, I've never seen anything like this before. And that was my first introduction to Christian music, and uh, and I thought it was pretty special, and that was a kind of precursor for the next 30 years for me. I remember being in Nashville my first months there that uh, I would call home because I was you know, scared out of my mind, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I was a waiter, and I was going nowhere fast. And I still remember this. I would... I would call home from the room that I was renting at this house uh, and feeling like this is, I don't think it's going to work out. And uh, I would call, my dad would answer the phone, or my mom or dad, but I, and I said, hey, can you put dad on? And I said, uh, I said, dad, uh, he said, how are you doing? And I said, well, uh, I'm a waiter. And he said, are you playing any music? And I said, no, not really. And he said, are you paying your rent? And I said, yes. And my dad said, my son's making it in Nashville. The funniest thing was I was doing the bare minimum that I could possibly do just to survive. And my dad's like, my son is making it in Nashville. True enough, my mom and dad came to visit six months after I'd been here. And uh, I took them on a tour of Nashville, a walking tour. And I remember I showed them the Ryman Auditorium and my dad put his arm around me and said, is this where my son's going to play someday? And I said, oh, dad, I kind of felt crushed because I was like, there's no way. You know, you've really got to make it to play at the Ryman. And I knew by then it's just probably not going to happen. And uh, my dad said, you know, I used to listen to the Grand Ole Opry uh, from here. And he put his arm around me and he said, he said, yeah, my son's going to play here one day. And, uh, and that just stuck with me. It kind of broke my heart, but that was in my head the whole time. And so, but I think there's something special about hearing a father's words speak over you. Uh, that they believe in you and uh, they kind of cast a vision for you. And I, I think there's something about that that you kind of grow into that as your story unfolds. So I had some detours uh, on my way to the Ryman, and uh, I was a waiter, and uh, and I also was an intern at BMI, which they collect royalties for singers and songwriters. So I did that for free, which is just, you know, right across the street from here. And uh, I took a girl's internship because she was leaving, and she said, hey, come have my job. And and she said, you know, you're crazy. You're a nut. You need to hang out with a guy named Mark DeVries. And I said, well, who is that? And she said, he's a youth minister at this church that I, you know, I'm at. And I, and I work with their youth, you know, the kids. And she said, you'd be great with him. You guys have the same personality. And I was like, oh, man, no way am I calling him because he'd make me hang out with kids. And that's, I'm allergic to him. So I ripped up the number and I threw it in the trash can. I thought I'd never want to meet this guy. And uh, so I didn't call him. And nine months later, I'm a waiter at uh, the Stouffer Hotel, which is the Renaissance Hotel now down in Nashville. I'm the only one on this Saturday that's working because there's nobody else there. And the manager said, if nobody comes in by 11, you can, you can just lock the door and go home. So I was looking so forward to that. This couple walks through the door at like 10.59. I'm like, sorry, we're closed. And I, they, came, they said, we've got a free lunch. We're supposed to have a free lunch here. And they had a little coupon. So I sat them at their table, and I brought their food out, and there's a hot pepper on this guy's plate, like a garnish. And he's like, uh, he's like, hey, waiter, I wanna, let's do a hot pepper eating contest. And I was like, okay, weirdo. Uh, so he cut the hot pepper in half, gave me the hotter half, and he said, whoever eats this hot pepper first loses. So I eat the hotter half, and he stares at me, and I stare at him, and my face turns red, and we start sweating. His wife's laughing, and I drink his water, and I drink his wife's water, and I lost. And he was like, man, you are a nut. Do you wanna hang out with kids? And I was like, no, I don't want to hang. And I said, what's your name? And he said, Mark DeVries. And I said, are you a youth minister in town? And he said, how would you know that? And I said, uh, a girl told me nine months to call you, and I just never did. And so he talked me into going on a ski trip, you know, with these kids. And I got duct taped to a bed at six o'clock in the morning on one of the ski trips. But he brought me back and he said, uh, hey, here's a grand piano. And he said, uh, I, want, I want you to come hang out here at the church. And he said, how much are you making as a waiter? And I was like, He's gonna offer me a job, so let me really jack the price up. So I said, $6.10 an hour, which is 10 cents more I was making. And he said, well, I'm gonna pay you $6.11 to come here and work for me. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, what'd you come here to do? And I said, well, 
I came here to write songs in Nashville. And he said, how many have you written this year? And I said, zero. And he said, why? And I said, because I'm trying to make enough money to live on so I can write songs. And then he said, well, that's why you're going to work for me, because you're just going to write songs. And I said, about what? And he said, whatever you want. And in your free time, just hang out with some kids. And I was like, are you kidding me? And uh, he set a hook in me like a fish. For seven years, I became the youth director at that church and fell in love with the kids, and my songs became about those kids. And he was like, here's a little guy in our youth group that's got cancer and his dad's struggling. Why don't you write a song for them? Here's a mission trip y'all went on. Why don't you write a song about that? And sure enough, I would write the song, and the kids would sing it on Sunday morning after our mission trip. And the whole congregation would feel like, man, we're a part of this thing. We feel like we know the story. We feel like we're connected with our kids. We feel like we're connected with what God's doing in your mission trip. And so kids would say, hey, will you play your songs? We'll play your song about our mission trip. And I would. And then they'd bring their parents. And then the concerts got bigger and bigger. And I did two concerts at First Presbyterian that were just wall to wall, you know, 800 to 1,000 people. And somebody said, hey, you should do a show at the Ryman uh, because you're getting too big for, the, for our church. And so I said, OK. And they were kidding. And I didn't know. So I just called the Ryman and asked them if I could do a concert there. And they said, who are you again? And I said, well, I'm a youth you know, director at a church. And so they're like, we've never done this before. And sure enough, uh, we planned it and did the whole thing. And a gospel choir came in and sang backgrounds. But I thought, man, if this doesn't work, it was costing me a lot of money to put this show. And I said, if this doesn't work, at least I'll say I did my best before I leave Nashville to say I did the best I could do. And I still remember, I didn't know how many people were in the audience. I was just hoping there were a few. And uh, Mark DeVries, the youth minister, walked down on stage. I've worked for him for seven years now. And he said, uh, we're here tonight because there was a kid from Kansas that uh, came to Nashville with a dream and surrounded himself with people who were just crazy enough to believe it might come true. And he said, welcome to Mark Schultz at the Ryman. And the curtain went up and I looked out in the audience and it was sold out and my mom and dad were sitting on the front row in the balcony uh, the record company was there they heard that, that there was a show there that night and they they just came to it and uh, and i got a record deal after that show and that was 18 years ago and we've been doing records and doing concerts ever since so it'll be one of those moments that i look back on that i feel like uh, again it was a you know a dad's vision and a belief and me just, you know, following that. The Lord was in it, and uh, had I not met uh, Mark DeVries, the youth minister, and I tell him this all the time, we run at 5.30 in the morning. I don't know why we run at 5.30 in the morning. There's other times it would be great to run to uh, during the day, but I've said it time and time again, I, I wouldn't I would have met my wife. I wouldn't have the kids that I have. I wouldn't have the career that I've had. I wouldn't have played at the Rhyme, and I wouldn't have... Uh, without meeting him. And, you know, he, it, what's so special about him is he wasn't the kind of boss, if you could call him that, as a youth minister that said, you need to do this so I can look good. He said, um, what's your talent? And let me just let me just love on you and tell you to be who you're meant to be. And let me get behind you and do that. And I feel like that's the that's been the difference, you know. And uh, I never did feel like he wanted anything from me. I felt like he wanted something for me. You know, and so that's the kind of dad that I try to be now. I've had six or seven or eight records I can't really remember, but what was so interesting when I wrote that first record was when I first came to Nashville, I thought, man, I just would like a record deal. And I was just looking for that as soon as I came to town. And it was as if God opened up a closet and there were a bunch of clothes in there. I've said this to to kids who want to get into music. And I and I said, I looked at those clothes and I was like, these clothes, these clothes do not fit me. They're just too big for me. I mean, I just... I don't even know how to fit in those clothes. So in a way, God closed the closet door, and then I meet Mark DeVries as a, as a youth minister, and uh, he says, come work for me, and I, and I do, and I spend seven years with kids and see what God's doing in the lives of the kids and the families, and I start writing songs about that. And then at the rhyme, and it was like, God opened up the door again. I was like, those clothes fit me now. I have something to say. And uh, it was from the experiences that I've had. And so um, during that time, uh, I had to learn how to become a dad. I had to learn how to become somebody that could take care of uh, a family, not just be a dad who shows up every once in a while and checks in and says, everybody okay? But, you know, be a, 
to be a great dad. And it was like, when I first started, it was like, I opened up the closet door and here's these clothes. I'm like, there's no way I can fit in these clothes. Now, after six years, I feel like I could open it up and I could look in there and go, oh, I see what that means now. And I see how I'm changed now. And I see where uh, I have more of a passion for, uh, you know, my wife has a in an, in an office that says, uh, your greatest gift to the world may not be what you do, it may be who you raise. And uh, and so stepping inside those clothes and saying, uh, hey, maybe it's not about me, ab- about all this and what kind of song I can deliver. Maybe it's about what my sons are going to do when they grow up or my daughter. My wife said, hey, we should do devotionals at dinner time, you know. And so in the middle of our table, we've got a Lazy Susan, I guess is what you call that. And it's got the candles and it's got... Uh, stuff on anyway uh, she put a devotional book there and uh, so at night after dinner she'll say hey let's read a devotional so we'll pull out the devotional book and we'll read it and uh, funny enough so I'm coming to the I'm coming to the interview today and I brought my son Ryan with me and we're walking out the door and she said uh, what's your interview for and I said well it's Jesus calling she smiled and she walked over to the table and she picked it up and she said you want to just take it with you? And I was like, it's the kid's version of Jesus Calling that we've been reading out of as our devotion. What's so funny about it is that when I read it at dinner time and the kids are taking their plates and all that kind of stuff, and I'm telling my wife, hey, this is pretty good. This is actually a very good, devo- <laughs> this is a very good devotional. I think I'd like to read this, probably because it's just my speed since it's for kids. But, but I think it's been great. And here we've been reading out of it for two years. And I, I looked at the front of the book and saw what it was called, Jesus Calling. So pretty neat, pretty neat story. This is called A Taste of Heaven, July 8th. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. When you come to me, be ready. I am a God of unlimited blessings, so get ready to be blessed. Open up your heart and mind to receive more and more of me. And as you do, I will pour in my blessings of love, peace, and joy until you are overflowing. These blessings are only a tiny taste of what waits for you in heaven. The joy that you have for me now is like a sparkler in your own backyard, while the joy of heaven is more like the fireworks in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July, but ever so much greater. I give you real joy in this world, but in heaven, I will make your joy complete and overflowing. So I was adopted, and and uh, and the story continues. So we, we said, maybe we should adopt, too. You know, my wife, was, and she said, let's go to China and adopt a a little baby from China. So Maya May is our newest member of our family. She's almost two now and just the huge joy in our life. And so, yeah, it's something to be a dad and it's something to adopt and have a dad. And I'll say this, this is what I know about adoption. And this uh, this has been a big thing for me to realize. When I was adopted, and I think the reason I've done well and excelled in whether it was football or basketball or baseball or music, was a part of it was in a, in a small way, I was like, well, I didn't want my parents to adopt me and then think they got a dud. So I was like, I want to be great at everything I did, you know, and I wanted to be the pitcher and I want to be the quarterback and I want to be all that kind of stuff. And I want to sing and I want to perform and standing ovations. And that's, that feels good. And that's affirming like, Hey, uh, they made a good choice. And so when we adopted her, the switch that happened to me in the adoption story is that, uh, you know, I knew her for about 10 minutes. And I said, man, there's nothing she can do to make me love her more or love her less or think anything more or less of her. I just, man, I, she is a part of me. I just love her. And uh, that was a huge thing for me. And we hear it all the time in Christian churches like, hey, we're adopted, we're children of God, we're adopted. And, but it doesn't stop us from thinking, if I do more, if I do a little more, God will think, you know, wow, wow, and all this kind of stuff. And now I get this sense from adopting our little girl that that is such a busy backwards. Again, it's the idea of God doesn't want something from us. He wants something for us. And so I think that's been the big takeaway for me from adopting our daughter. I'm glad there was part of me that said, oh, maybe that's the end of our adoption story is me. But I'm so glad that we took that full circle because now I feel like I got a clearer picture of what adoption and what God meant when he meant adoption. To learn more about Mark's latest projects or his nonprofit, The Remember Me Mission, follow him on social media. If you'd like to hear more stories about the healing power of music, check out our interview with superstar singer Gloria Gaynor.
Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with writer and entrepreneur Maddie Jackson Selectman. Maddie and her husband Ben were a month away from celebrating their first wedding anniversary when Ben, a healthy 28-year-old lawyer, passed away after suffering a traumatic head injury after a fall. Maddie reflects on the pain and struggle that come from asking this question over and over again. Why? At the end of the day, what we were praying for Ben happened. Like, we kept praying, make him be healed and whole, and he is. He's just with Jesus, you know, and that's the most healed and whole you can be, but it is very difficult, and I know this is why a lot of people struggle in suffering, is that, you know, God could have stopped it. And on paper, we did all the things we were supposed to do, you know, quote unquote, to get the miracle, but we didn't. And part of understanding and and processing and finding, you know, joy amidst the pain, I think doesn't come from having that question answered. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.